I just spoke to Dr. Hirschfeld yesterday. She's back from the hospital, from the rehab uh, center, and she's uh, at home and very anxious to get back to, to work. Uh, so I, I did speak to her. She also had a few recommendations for books that I'm going to put together for you. Cool. And I'll probably email them in. And I think um, <clears throat> you'll be able to benefit from that. What I'd like to do today is just to look at some of the philosophical foundations of China that, of course, persist right into the 21st century. And these are fairly, uh, uh, what I'd like to do is just look at a few major points, particularly Confucianism and ideas of filial piety uh, and basic, the, the basic five relationships that are very, very important uh, in not just Chinese uh, civilization and history, but uh, certainly throughout most of, if not all of Asia and its, and its variations and its, in different forms, particularly in, uh, of course, Korea and in, certainly in Japan and Vietnam. But when we're looking at, of course, uh, these philosophical foundations, we're going back <clears throat> to a period in uh, Chinese history between, say, the 8th century well into, of course, the, um, and today I'd like to get up to perhaps maybe the 3rd century uh, AD <clears throat> with the establishment and the collapse of the Han. But more importantly, I think I just want to focus on aspects of uh, the ancient philosophies, but particularly some of the key uh, teachings uh, looking at Buddhism, I'm sorry, uh, Confucianism, Taoism, Legalism, which are of course very, very important for us to understand the, uh, the philosophical foundations of, of, of Asia in general. We're looking at a period, when we look at say the 8th century to approximately the 3rd century BC, we're looking at a period that is generally broken down into two, two eras. The first couple of hundred years from say uh, 722 to about 481 is known as the spring and autumn period and this is of course referred to by writers and scholars uh, throughout uh, Asian history in of course Japan, Korea and China and it has a very poetic um, sense to it and then of course the period right after that for another about from the 5th century 403 to about 221 BC we're looking at the Warring States period Again, a title that would be used by particularly the Japanese <coughs> in the period up to about 1570. But we're looking at this period of, of, of chaos. We're looking at a period of uh, turmoil, political turmoil. Uh, but what's interesting also is against this backdrop of um, intrigue and political turmoil, we'll see tremendous developments taking place in terms of iron casting, in terms of in infantry armies, we see a transition from <clears throat> the chariot, the use of the chariot, into the use uh, and the uh, promotion of cavalry. So there's an awful lot of development that takes place against this back a backdrop of, of, of rivalries, of of course uh, political uh, chaos. Uh, but we do have, of course, the um, beginnings of private ownership of land. We see, of course, there's a tremendous degree of social mobility during this time. And we also, of course, see people who will try to find solutions to all the problems that they're observing and that they're living through. And particularly, we could look at, of course, um, Confucius. And looking at Confucius, we're looking at a man who was a minor court official um, and <clears throat> who tried to um, make things better at court, but of course no one would listen to him. And then he would make his way uh, with his disciples. He would go from one town, one place to another, and just simply uh, try to make uh, comments in terms of what ought to be done and, and what to do. And the idea was simply he was looking at uh, what he considered, of course, this idealized version of political rule, uh, looking back at the Zhou emperors, uh, and during the period of what he considered to be of stability, of propriety, and <clears throat> of course hierarchy and stability. Well, when we're looking here, uh, I guess the most important thing when we look at Confucius is there are a number of things. One, of course, is his emphasis on um, hierarchy, on ritual on protocol and respect. 
And for what is particularly interesting, when we talk about um, what is known as filial piety, it's a very important concept in the sense that um, we have a, a sense of um, not just respect for the parents, for the children, it's a reciproc reciprocating kind of relationship between um, five basic relationships. So when we're looking at the concept of filial piety, we're looking at the effort on the part of Confucius to maintain this kind of uh, order. So in a, in a period of chaos, he's looking for trying to establish and promote the need for order based on respect, based on a hierarchical um, um, nature of, of relationships. The relationships that we're looking at in particular, there were five basic relationships. So, you have, of course, the relationship between father, son, husband, wife, siblings, friends, and this is important. This is an important one, too, because we often, somewhere, probably in the 19th century, someone came up with this idea of master or slave. Maybe it was Hegel, perhaps, yes? Uh, and it was translated, of course, into this relationship between the monarch and, of course, those under him, when in fact that's not what it is. So it's very important to understand what Confucius is talking about in these five relationships. And this relationship is between the monarch and his advisor. So you'll see that the Confucianists are going to try to preserve their autonomy. Uh, and that's a very important uh, point. So the relationship between the monarch and the advisor is one where the advisor, basically his duty is to provide sound advice to the monarchy, to be free of any kind of particular influence. Now each of these five relationships is a, has a special kind of meaning. And it's important to know what those meanings are, rather than just simply the five relationships. So, the relationship between, say, husband and wife, well, it's certainly not love, that's for sure. We don't have time for that. Uh, we're looking at, basically, gender-specific roles. The role of the husband, the role of the, of the mother. The relationship between friends, that's pretty obvious. It's based on trust. The relationship between siblings, is what do you think it is? What would that be? It's very con it's almost contrary to any kind of notion that we would have in the West. That relationship between the siblings is based on an understanding of what? What would you think it could be? Responsibility. First born. Re responsibility, okay. What were you saying there? When they were born. They yeah, that's what it is. It's exactly that that's exactly what it is. It's a matter of basically precedence. So, the older sibling has precedence over the younger siblings. That's really what it is. And the relationship, what else do we have in here? The relationship between... Um, How about the sex? Oh, uh, uh, between the um, husband and wife, gender roles. So this is what the mother does. This is what she does in terms of running the house, raising the family. Uh, the father basically is going to be out in the, in the fields or maybe in, in some sort of an office or he's, something basically in support of the family. Uh, yes. The children, though. The children, male and female? Oh, between, oh, yes, the siblings. Uh, what we have there is, again, similar to responsibility. Again, it's based on this idea of precedence. So the older siblings, of course, have precedence over the younger siblings. So, and, uh, yes? Does that, does, that, does that include the sex of, so uh, an older girl would have uh, over over a younger brother? And, yeah, the older the older sister is the girl. The girl is definitely going to have, but still the the boy is going to be in the number of kind of preferred child. It seems, and unfortunately, we have many even contemporary examples. I have I have friends who, um, of course, Chinese, uh, but very American. The children were of course raised here, uh, but the boy is the second. He's he was a doctor. He became a doctor, and the daughter is a lawyer. But I, you can still sense there is this kind of tension on the part of Diana in regard to, of course, her relationship with, with the mother, because the mother seems to give preference, of course, to, to the son, and that's just the way it seems to have been for many, many thousands of years.
So while we're looking here, I would just like to uh, introduce you to a few of the collected writings, of course, of Confucius as they were recorded by his disciples over, over the, the um, generations. And in particular, we, we would see these collected in the Analects, which you may have read, of course, when you were <clears throat> in school. But just to give you an idea, I think it's very important for us to get a sense of what Confucius is, is basically trying to, to, te to, uh, to tell us. So, quoting from the, from the Analects, we, we read, The Master said, <clears throat> When your father is alive, observe his intentions. Again, we're talking about filial piety here. After he passes away, model yourself on the memory of his behavior. If in three years after his death you have not deviated from your father's ways, then you may be considered a filial child. The master said, lead the people by means of government policies and regulate them through punishments, and they will, evas they will be evasive and have no sense of shame. Lead them by means of virtue and regulate them through rituals, and they will have a sense of shame, and moreover, have standards. The master said, by 15, <clears throat> I was intent on learning. By 30, I was standing straight. By 40, I was no longer confused. By 50, I knew heaven's commands. By 60, I was attuned. And at 70, I could follow my heart's desires without transgressing, transgressing what is right. The gentleman is not a tool. Okay. On and on. So you can get an idea of these kinds of precepts that are very, very important uh, in terms of fostering an environment by which governance, by which social order, by which um, the family order is, is maintained and promoted. Now a few other, of course, this, is, this, this time in, in Chinese history, of course, we're looking at not just Confucianism, but also a number of other um, and they refer to this period as the Hundred Schools of Thought. Uh, during this chaotic period, there were many people who, of course, uh, had many solutions and many recommendations. And we also see, uh, with, the, uh, with the, the use of, uh, I guess I would say, the, the writing system, and, of course, collecting these, these ideas and, and printing them, and putting them together so that there will be a, a collection of writings it fostered uh, debate. It fostered um, also a degree of continuity. And basically, you would have schools of thought. So you would have the Confucianists. You would have, of course, then perhaps those who challenged Confucius, uh, who didn't agree with the positive nature of Confucius. In other words, his outlook on life, which was very positive, considering some of the alternatives that were promoted at well, as well at this time. Perhaps uh, when we look at one of his followers, Mencius, uh, who was basically, a, well, he, he studied with Confucius' grandson um, about a hundred years after um, Confucius died. We see also the continuity of, of Confucius' positive out, outlook on life. And we see Comentius getting into uh, very interesting argu arguments about the nature, about human nature. And what we have is a, is a, is Basically, well, people are saying, well, we're fundamentally good, or we're fundamentally corrupt. And there are all kinds of analogies that are used. Uh, and this one I find particularly interesting when we have uh, <coughs> excuse me, a discussion regarding about human nature. Uh, and we have one critic of Confucius, one critic, of course, of Mencius, who looks at human nature. And he, he writes, Basically, he's looking at um, proof could be found in people's spontaneous response to the sufferings of others. Anyone today who suddenly sees a baby, this is, this is Mencius, this is his positive uh, outlook. Anyone who sees a baby <coughs> who's about to fall into a well uh, feels, feels alarmed and concerned and automatically reaches out to help without thought of personal gain. However, his critics, uh, one in particular by the name of Gal G., uh, basically looks at Mencius as philosophical, uh, could be considered his opponent. Um, he argued that huma human nature is like whirling water. When an outlet is open to the east, it flows east. When an outlet is open to the west, it flows west. And Mencius responds to this. He counters, 
Water, it is true, is not inclined to either east or west, but does it have no preference for high or low? Goodness is to human nature, like flowing downward is to water. Just as water can be forced up, people can be led to be bad. But this is not their nature, natural inclination. So Mencius is not going to use, he's going to persevere with his, his optimist, uh, optimistic outlook. Now, also, when we're looking at, of course, um, let me put it over here. Another major, and this is actually quite important uh, when we look at uh, the evolution from the Zhou into, of course, Qin and Han China. And this is, of course, by the time we get into the third century uh, BC, we'll, we'll have the establishment of Qin, as we know, China, and then into Han. This is the first emperor with the establishment of the Qin dynasty in 221 BC. Prevalent amongst, of course, um, the efforts of the, um, the Qin court and his advisors was, of course, this idea of legalism. And you hear, you hear, even today, you hear criti critics of people in certain institutions um, who are often uh, who will criticize the legalism of certain uh, members of, of some sort of organization. Well, legalism, of course, is an insistence on the need for laws, rules, and punishments, contrary, of course, to Confucius. Now, what's interesting is, of course, with the establishment of a new imperial dynasty, with, this, with the establishment of the Qin, uh, we have, of course, this um, authoritarian approach uh, and it's backed up by these, by the need and the recognition and the imposition <coughs> of laws, of legal, uh, basically of rules and regulations just about that address just about every, every issue that could be thought of in terms of punishments, in terms of procedures, in terms of, in, of, of legal um, and governance. One of the interesting things about Confucianism, and what happens when we have with the, with the establishment of Qin and the promotion of legalism, what we have um, is, of course, a direct attack on Confucianism. And the early years of the new Qin dynasty are very, very short-lived. We're talking perhaps maybe only 15 years because of the harshness. And it stayed in the memory, the historical memory of, of successive um, empires and uh, imperial courts and uh, dynasties. One of the reasons that Confucianism was, was basically almost wiped out because of the, of the legalism and the new Qin dynasty was that Confucianism, as you just, we just said, we just uh, saw, was critical of, of the over um, emphasis on laws. It was critical of, uh, basically it was the, there to preserve the, this balance between the heavens and, and between the imperial court and between earth. That's why even during the 1960s, during the Cultural Revolution, as we'll see later, um, a lot of the Confucian, a lot of the historical and cultural aspects of Chinese culture were destroyed. Uh, and one of the things about, of course, Confucianism is that it's going to posit a direct challenge to the emperor. If the emperor is not basically following what is perceived as the mandate of heaven, if it is not basically that the imperial court of the dynasty is not following what uh, is to be a just and noble course of action, the direct challenge, of course, is going to be found in Confucianism. And as a result, with the Qin dynasty, with the establishment of this new dynasty, we see, of course, no tolerance whatsoever for any kind of criticism of its rule. And as a result, we have, of course, a major, major event in which the writings of Confucius and the writings of his disciples are gathered up and burned. So we have a major book burning, and not only do they burn the... Uh, the, uh, the works of Confucius and his, and his disciples. Um, but they also gather up the, the, I guess you could call them the professors, and bury them alive. So this was not a very pleasant time for anyone involved in 
um, basically <laughs> offering advice to the imperial court. Fortunately, it's, uh, a number of Confu the writings of Confucius were, were buried and hidden uh, and were discovered, of course, after all of this calmed down by the time we get into with the establishment of the Han Dynasty uh, in the third century uh, BC. <clears throat> now another, of course, major um, component or uh, teaching is that of Taoism. Taoism seems to be, to, to many people, a rather <clears throat> kind of um, difficult um, uh, teaching to, to, to more or less explain. And it is, in other words, it's a, it's a belief in the confidence of the way. The, the characters that are used for Taoism, the characters do the way. And, and just to give you an example here, the idea is we want to keep the state out of our lives. We want, basically, we don't want to be, a, you could consider Confucianism to be an activist kind of approach to, to philosophy, to life, whereas Taoism is not. Taoism is going to be quite the opposite. It's going to be much more of a passive approach. In other words, Taoists defend private life and wanted the rulers to leave people alone. They seek to go beyond everyday concerns. They let their minds wander in the more fanciful aspects of life. They did not place human beings at the center of the cosmos and were concerned that human contrivance upsets the natural order of things. Rather, they affirmed the way, or Tao, the indivisible, indescribable, immaterial force or energy that is the source of all that exists or happens. Very, very difficult to make sense of, but it does. <laughs> if you just simply concentrate and focus on what the way is. The way is, of course, within us. It's the, it's the indefinable uh, essence of, of, of reality and of what truth is. In some ways, you could say, let nature take, take its course. Interestingly, it's also this time, as we go from the <coughs> Shin, excuse me, into the Han, uh, we have what is often referred to as um, this belief in the mysterious, this belief in the mystical. Um, we have um, <coughs> this spirituality, the spiritualism. We have also millenarianism, which of course um, is, is very interesting during this time. Uh, and we have the idea here that ritual and forms of behavior is a means of achieving heavenly, um, heavenly <coughs> salvation or immortality on earth. And this, of course, is also very prevalent amongst the imperial court, too. And we see quite a bit of efforts on the part of the emperors and members of the imperial court trying to find means by which they could have... Um, everlasting life. And such. There's also something very interesting too. There is a sense of the two natures of the soul. One which is the lighter component of the soul and the other is the heavier component which is basically what stays around around the grave, around the tomb, which can be, can be nourished and can be fed. Whereas the other one of course goes up into the heavens. So. Now, looking at this period during the Warring States, what we really see is a, is a time and a, a pattern here of, of unification and centralization. And this is what's going to characterize um, basically the, move, the movement and the efforts on the part of the various kingdoms, you could say. And it's really by the time we get to the third century BC that we see the unification of China. And we have now, of course, the first emperor, the son of heaven who is taking on all of these terms that we talked about last year and um, last week in terms of the mandate of heaven. But we also see, uh, again, an intolerance uh, in terms of anything that would not be um, mandated by him or his court. And that, of course, we see the standardization of currency. We see even the uh, regulation of roads. We see the measurement system standardized, we see the use of passports, we see highly efficient uh, practices being implemented. 
But of course, it is through very harsh means by which these, these uh, improvements are being made. And as a result, the, the first Huang Di, the, the uh, Yellow Emperor, of course, he doesn't really last more than just maybe 15 years or so, and then will be assassinated, and then, of course, he'll die. Uh, poisoned, we think, perhaps, we, we're not quite sure. To be succeeded by, what's interesting, a postal worker, basically a man who was in charge of a postal relay station. And he becomes basically the first Han emperor. And they, he and his court are well aware of the harshness and the cruelty of, of the Qin. And so they try certainly to avoid all of that. And Confucianism makes its way back into favor and certainly now acts as a guiding principle for, uh, for imperial rule, as well as for the establishment of government governance in China, which will last, certainly, um, well into, of course, the 20th century. There are a couple of things also which are important. Let me just see if I get another map up here for you. Again, I just wanted to give you an idea here. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually provide this in case anyone would like a copy of this, um, it will be made available for you, so you can take your notes and review it later. But again, just a very brief outline in terms of what's happening in this period. Uh, basically from the 8th century uh, BC, well into, of course, uh, the 3rd century. And then with the establishment of the Qin, and then in the Han, we still refer to Han Chinese, as proper Chinese as Han Chinese. Uh, they refer to themselves as Han Chinese, going back, of course, to this period in time. So we see the process of, of unification, centralization. This is always going to be a major concern in terms of how much power does the imperial court maintain? How much power does it keep? And of course, who are the biggest rivals? Who are going to be the biggest challenges to stability or to authority of, of the emperor? Where do you think it is? Who do you think possesses the greatest challenge to the imperial court? There are two, three sources. One, of course, we mentioned are the eunuchs. Two, who else do you think would be a great challenge? Warlords. Warlords. The warlords. But even closer to home. <laughs> the sons. The sons, sons and the family. <laughs> and it's going to be the people more or less encircling the concubines or, of course, the, um, the consorts of, of the emperor. And, and these women are very, very powerful. And one, one reason why is the, the emperor will basically put his sons out in a different, he'll keep them away. In other words, you don't want them too close to home. So he'll put them in the different provinces and the different counties. Uh, they will basically be in charge of garrisons, they will be monitored, they will be checked. But it's the families of the consorts that of course are basically finding opportunities for power within the imperial court too. And you'll see many instances uh, uh, when there is a power vacuum, uh, there is a basically there's a rival, there's rivalry <coughs> court. And who orchestrates a lot of this? are the eunuchs. And the eunuchs are basically uh, brought in. The, the eunuchs are not from, you could say, the noble families, certainly not. But they were brought in because they are dependable. They can be counted on to do the bidding, whatever it is that the emperor wants, to keep a check, of course, uh, in terms of what's going on with the consorts and the concubines and, and all of that. But they also, at many different stages, at many different stages in Chinese history, will have so much power that they will actually overthrow the emperor. Uh, at, not without, of course, um, <laughs> repercussions. But the eunuchs, the members of his own family, and of course the members of the family of his consort are the three greatest challenges, in addition to, of course, the warlords in the, in the out outlaying areas. But that's really where you have a major concern on the part of trying to create a stable form of government. Because you've got to have that balance. You've got the problems that are within 
but you've both got the problems as, from without as well. And that's a very, very tricky situation that many of these uh, <clears throat> imperial rulers will have to contend with in terms to what degree do they maintain centralized power as opposed to that balance between de decentralization and centralization. Okay? <clears throat> With the establishment, and even though it may be a, not very, very long in duration, but what we, we have with, the, with this creation of the Qin Dynasty is really the basis of what will become China in terms of its geography, in terms of its size. And the population, interestingly, is about what? This is an important point, too, because the emperors want to make sure that they have a population. They need the population. They need it for their military. They need it for an it's an agriculturally based society. They need also population to provide the tax revenues. So it's very, very important uh, for um, the population to be sustained, to be promoted. And what do you think the population would be around this time? Just take a guess and see. 20 million. A million. 54 million. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting too, if you look at this, uh, what I find particularly, you no, know, I don't want to do this, but I'll just throw it out there. Uh, we're looking at, with the Qin and the Han dynasty, with these dynasties, they were talking about 400 years. Okay, we're going from, say, 3rd century BC to 3rd century AD. So we're looking at, at basically what other great empire is, is, is more or less on the other side of the world is the Roman Empire. Now one of the interesting things, the differences between, and they're not really very similar at all, but what is interesting is that with the, um, unlike Rome, you may have, of course, as your lingua franca, you might have, of course, uh, Latin, but you're going to have an incredibly diverse um, cultural basis, uh, very unlike in China, where you have, because of the nature of the language, that language provides great, a great degree of, of unification and cultural transmission and identity. And it also, it also provides uh, uh, people who are uh, part of this Asian culture, this, this center of kingdom, the middle kingdom, which is of what, will, of course, the Chinese refer to themselves as, as, as the middle kingdom. It provides cultural prestige in terms of the identity. It provides tremendous benefits to be part of this empire. And it's a much more unified empire than, say, uh, ancient Rome was. Again, I, I do hesitate to draw any kind of parallels, but it's just interesting to see uh, what, what is happening in terms of these empires. And of course, yes? Uh, regarding that map, the Qin and the Han, what area did they occupy? And whether, like in Rome, where the barbarians attacked, did the same thing occur? Sure. Well, what we're looking at is roughly, I may have mentioned the other day, we're looking at a thousand miles from east to west, a thousand miles north to south. We see already the construction, uh, a continued construction of the walls in the north. This was not built over just maybe one or two uh, generations. This was ongoing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it was basically to, to keep out um, the so-called um, uh, marauders from the north. And what we see happening, you know, they'll come around too. We know them as the Mongols, and we'll see them. Come, they'll come mar march, literally marching down. But the Chinese are trying to pr pr protect themselves from what is developing uh, as a nomadic people uh, in the north and on the steppes of, of Central Asia. And as a defense, this is a major concern for, for of course, the, uh, for the dynasties, uh, both in, well, certainly. Uh, early days of the Qin, but certainly during, during the entire 400 years of the Han. And one of the problems also, and related to this, uh, is where do you think the greatest expense was? Was simply in trying, they were overextended. In many ways, similar again to, to Rome, but the, the Chinese were, the Han dynasty was overextended and had to spend 
a tremendous amount of its resources in just defending its in, in internal boundaries, so to speak. So is that, th those different colors there, are they different provinces, or, or that whole thing is Han and Chin? What? It, 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 it is, it is, it's, it is Chin and then into Han. Yes, and so you see the unification of these different kingdoms into that. It's also, a, this is a map that's reflecting the geographical differences too. But we're looking at the unification of all of maybe ten different, ten different kingdoms. And that was during the Warring States period, and gradually you see the emergence of one hegemonic power. So with this unification, with the Qin, we see, of course, the entire unification of what will become basically China. Yes? Is the Gobi Desert on that map there? Where is that? It's going to be up here up to the Way left. Up. Yes. Right. I could find one in there for you. I'd have to, <laughs> to scroll ahead. Let me see if I have a better map from this. If it seems to. Probably more notes. Yes. So. Well, looking at daily life, I mean, again, we're looking at, um, <clears throat> it's an agriculturally based society. The, the, the dynasty has to uh, ensure its revenue based on uh, its taxes, uh, based on, of course, uh, its control. It has state-run monopolies of, of, of salt, it has state-run monopolies of key industries, uh, and it also uh, is um, again, its major expense would be in, in terms of defense. Now, what I have up here, looking at the role of the family, we're looking at an agricultural based grouping. And the role of filial piety, which we've already discussed, the, the family is, of course, the basic economic unit. One thing that is also very um, unfortunate in this case is that we have a patrilineal society, we have, of course, uh, <coughs> The question here of inheritance. So, when the father dies, what happens to the property? Ideally, what, what you would do is you would basically what they do in England. You would have something uh, where it would be entailed to the son or to a nephew. But here in China, it's not. Pardon me. From a janitor. Right, and it, that's what they would have in England. Here, no, the land is divided up. And this is, this is not the best thing for the family, in the sense that we have private ownership of land, we have the breakdown basically of the estate, and the big, basically it's being divided up. So everybody is more or less now trying to, to survive based on what it can, how it can produce on that little bit of land that it has. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a development that is not in the best interest of the farmers, who are going to oftentimes be faced with poverty. And starvation. Um, again, the nature of the woman here, so called the humble estate. Um, and again, no positions, no formal <coughs> positions of authority, uh, but a force in politics, which is interesting. We see that particularly in the imperial courts. That's where we see them uh, have a major, major uh, position. Then, of course, uh, as, as you know, <clears throat> based on the geography, based on the um, landscape, there is the northern, the northern part of China. The landscape, the, the geography is very different from that of the south. Uh, but looking at, of course, the diet will be very different as well in terms of what can be grown in the north, which is basically millet as opposed to the rice cultures are in the south. Yes? Um. Even on a basic level of the family unit, wasn't it the mother and the mother or mother-in-law who had all of the authority in the house? In the house, the mother will have authority in the house. I mean, over over everybody. But the father is still in charge. But in terms of daily authority, the mother is not going to be certainly involved with everything in terms of the raising of the family, the raising of and the farming. She's involved in everything. That's, real, quite, that's, that's a lot of authority. It is. It is. It is. And then don't forget also, even in the imperial court, 
these women are, are, are these are the women who are producing the heirs. So there is a lot of authority, uh, considering the, the limitations of time and, and, and place at that time. So one thing I did want to mention, and that of course was the Silk Route, the Silk Road, uh, which was a major um, component beginning certainly in the Qin, certainly before the Qin, even in the late Zhou, but certainly well into the Han period. And this is where you have uh, the Chinese government, even the imperial court, sending out, um, I guess you would call them um, emissaries, to see what actually uh, is happening as far, um, I guess, west as Bactria, as far as going into, of course, um, um, into basically certain areas where silk is being traded. Of course, we have the Silk Route. This is a major, major uh, component of it. It's also part of its economy. Uh, and of course, uh, you may know that silk was such a major part of this trading uh, system that Augustus uh, in Rome was a little concerned about um, the cost, how people, how many, how women were buying so much silk, he actually had to put into, many times he would try to uh, curb their spending of silk uh, in terms of uh, how much money was being drained from, from this coming in from China. It was a very popular, it was very much in demand. Now, just, just to give you a very, very brief, um, summary here, and I, I don't think we need to go into too much just to give you an idea of what's going on. So we're going back into the ancient times, we're going into the Shia dynasty, into the Shan, which is where we're talking about the Bronze Age. Then we get into the Zhou, which we just went through with Christ, the Confucius, the Warring States, and then Mencius. And then we have, by the time we get to 221 BC, we have, of course, the establishment of the Qin, and then right after that, the Han. Uh, and right into, of course, um, third century AD. So that's basically our general chronology now. So what I'd like to do for our next focal point, pardon my, my voices, <coughs> is um, just to give you a degree of here of, of continuity. We we've mentioned already uh, the significance of using this local centric, this ideographic uh, language, uh, pictographic. I wish if we had a board in here too, it would be kind of fun to, to write, um, so you can see how it how it uh, how it works. And so the standardization of the writing system is very very important and very key in terms of establishing the cultural foundations as well as as well as the political foundations. Uh, the Chinese literature we mentioned a little bit about that in terms of poetry, in terms particularly what's reflected in the poems are basic stories that are very much grounded in three areas. One you'll have the court romances, too, you'll have, of course, the, the hardships of the, of the agricultural sect, people in the agricultural sector, and three, of course, um, the uh, experiences of those in, involved in the military. Uh, and we also, of course, we have discovered the, the uh, tomb of the first emperor. But there's one problem. Can't open it because if we try it, we're, they're sure they're going. They're going to find some means of doing it. But if we do, it will implode because it's been buried and it's it's just going to destroy everything that's in that. So they're trying to figure. I'm sure they will within any any short period of time that that will be addressed. Again, these are just simple examples of the bronzeware of these vessels and these terracotta, uh, these terracotta tombs, which you may have heard about, um, <clears throat> which of course were discovered about 40, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, so there's still quite a bit of uh, anthropological and archaeological undertakings. <clears throat> and these are the terracotta warriors. Okay. And I just thought maybe you can um, more or less look at the idea of, of the role of geography. Um, 
Do you have any questions about number two in here, the tenets of Confucianism, and how did they, how, do you have any questions about Confucianism? Yes. Given communism today, and its anti-religion base, do they still, how, what's the status of Confucianism, Taoism? Uh, <coughs> are they practiced in secret, or stamped down, or? Right, well, the state wants to control just about every aspect of people's lives. Uh, and that particularly, would, would, in terms of Confucianism, um, it's very interesting because you'll, if you're, uh, what has happened in the past, say, 15 years or 20 years ago, is this uh, promotion of what is called Confucius Institute. And you'll see these Confucius Institutes uh, popping up in universities throughout the world. And what these Confucius, we have one at Temple. There was one at Pittsburgh, I think they got into trouble. They had a very controversial uh, in terms of how the Chinese government controls um, its basic, I guess you could say, what happened in Pittsburgh and elsewhere was the Confucius Institute was beginning to more or less uh, get involved in the um, curricular development, and that was not really its, its job. Temple is a completely separate thing, but the point is, um, in terms of tolerance of Confucianism, uh, you will see, you will find Taoist temples, you'll see Confucian temples. Uh, just how prevalent and influential they are is questionable, but it's certainly controlled by the state. And, uh, of course, other religions too. I don't know, I'm not quite sure how missionary, Christian missionary uh, work is in China, I know that I, I know of people who snuck over there and I didn't really want to know about it. Um, it was too dangerous and they would sneak Bibles and things like that. You have also, um, the Catholic Church has an underground church, but it also has an official church, which is problematic. Uh, because again, the, the Chinese government wants control over all of those elements. And you can't blame them in a way because of its history in terms of what China had to go through since the middle, the early part of the 19th century. So you will see uh, a, a, you will see a greater degree of social mobilization taking place as well um, during this entire period. Yes. And uh, we have time after, during after organization during organization. How we, how do they spend their leisure time? Uh, music, poetry. Oh, uh, <clears throat> for the farmer, I don't see much time. Um, there would be different seasons of the year, but I would think um, the traditional arts, such as in puppetry, um, there would be different kinds of um, plays that would be um, performed uh, using the puppets or using, um, I guess we would call them uh, made of paper, and little dolls like that, uh, poetry and literature. But these are, again, probably for the more um, urban or perhaps the elite. We also see, uh, with Confucianism, we see the standardization of education. Mm -hmm. So, which is basically going to be the hub of, of the any dynasty will be, of course, its Confucian-based um, educators and, and students. And we see, of course, with that the establishment of academies. Now one of the things that we of course we will be talking about is of course the so-called examination system where we see in Han and subsequent dynasties uh, an emphasis on merit-based uh, promotions. However, that's the ideal. That's not the reality because it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to basically when we're looking at someone who's on the farm, it's going to be very difficult for them to just dedicate their, say, one of their sons to the hours and hours and hours that are necessary to learn Chinese, to master the classics, to master Confucianism, to master any other of these uh, literary texts that are essential to pass the examinations in order to serve in the local governments or in, of course, the imperial government. 
So what you have is a system that ideally would be, it's called the examination system, eventually it will evolve into the so-called examination system. But it's, it was, ideally it's based on merit. But the reality is it's just completely different because what you're going to have are the same families who have, of course, the means by which to dedicate one of their children, at least one of their sons, who does, they don't have to worry about the cost, and they have, to, they have to pay for the, the education as well. So what happens is you're going to have the, the gradual uh, development of an intellectual elite. We would refer to them as the Mandarins later on. And so this is a more of a self-promoting, self-sustaining um, group of government leaders, both at the local and central levels, which basically cuts everybody else off because the average farmer is not going to have the time or the means to basically take all the time it takes in the part uh, to, to master the classics. We're talking years, years. It's a class system. So what happens as a result is what we you know, would identify as a class system. It would be an intellectual or an elite. And there is a hierarchy. There will definitely be a hierarchy. So we really can't think of, of China, certainly you know, well, today, of course, this is the, these are the ideals of communism, as you'll see. But we're really looking at a, a, a system that is hierarchical in nature. It's very structured, very regimented. Uh, it's based on blood. It's based on patrilineal lines. Uh, and so we do have, a, we have an intellectual elite, and we have a nob nobility. We have a military elite, even though the military would be somewhat lower than the, the nobility or the intellectual elite. There are four basic class units. Uh, when we look at the, the as we look at the traditional structure of society in Asia, and this can go for Japan, it can go, it holds true for Korea as well. What we're looking at, you have four basic groups, and what we see happening as you get involved, as you'll see this gradual evolution here, um, it, four basic groups. So you'll have at the top. And this is for each of, of the other Asian countries. At the top will be, which is kind of nice, you'll have the, the intellectuals. They're at the top. And then the Japanese, of course, have their own little uh, way of doing it. They put the warrior and, and the intellectual at the top. But the, the, the warrior has to be literate. That's the, that's the key, is to have that degree of literacy is at the top. Then, the second group, who do you think they are? What are the four groups? It's kind of fun when I talk to uh, when I talk to the university students, and most of you, like for example, whether it be could be Penn, could be uh, Temple, could be Villanova, and everyone now is rushing to go to the business school. You know, they want their Wharton degree or something. <laughs> and um, you know what's interesting is that when you look at the four traditional, based on Confucian principles, these are based on Confucian and Neo-Confucian principles. You have, of course, the, the literati at the top. Next come the, the farmer, the farmer. The farmers are the jewel of the, they're the jewel. There's a saying uh, that they are the jewel of, of the nation. Um, well, that's what, without, they, without, without the farmer, what can you do? Then the third group would be the artisan, the people who actually produce things that we need. Uh, most of the time. And at the bottom, at the very bottom, are the merchants. Mm -hmm. yeah. merchants. The merchants. Yeah. They're at the bottom. <laughs> there are general? also sub subclasses as well. Um, you could refer to them as um, um, non-human beings. So there are people who are regarded as non-human beings. And that, that you'll, you'll see the classification of these people much later on, especially after next week when we get into Buddhism, you'll see that anyone that handles anything to do with um, animals or dead leather, things. right, dead things, yeah. yes? Similar to what goes on in <coughs> India with their caste? Yes, it, it would be not as, not as um, complicated. Um, it's a little simpler in the sense you've got basically these four groupings, but the majority <coughs> of the population is, is number two, the majority of the population is, is of the farming agricultural group, uh, and, but the ruling elite is, of course, of the educated and the imperial court. The imperial, by the way, of course, is above the clouds, 
they're not even in, in this because he's the son of heaven, and, and so they're way up there. Okay. Um, right. Yes. Right. Well, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Is there anything in the writings where they would be, where it shows they were interested in <coughs> in the ocean? You know, what was what yes, 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 yes. They didn't care. Sure. Yes. And your soul was asking me the other day too if they thought the world was flat. Well, yes, there was maritime, and there was maritime um, uh, exploration, uh, particularly, no, no, uh, certainly as far as even Africa, certainly going into, when we get into uh, the 15th, 14th, 13th century, you'll see that we've got some famous accounts of, 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 of Chinese generals, uh, admirals, um, exploring. Um, going into basically uh, Europe, uh, certainly Maybe Africa. Stay up close to the land. Yes. There yes. Like yes. 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 Correct. Uh, you know that all. That's also this. This is a very important topic too. I, I know that you have. I just want while where you mentioned this, there's also developing during this time, and it's a very important point for us to. It's still discussed. I mean, just the other day we had a big conference, and this was a major. This is you'll see happening as. The Chinese are beginning to unite and centralize. They establish the imperial courts, the dynasties will establish relations with territory with neighbors. And that is based on what is known as a tributary system. And that means basically you have a system whereby China will recognize the neighboring people and will give them a name, will give them a calendar, and will give them other token. Um, artifacts of recognition of their status vis-a-vis -vis the Middle Kingdom. So this is all beginning now to take place in terms of how China, once it's now centralized, it will begin to establish itself and its relations and define its relations with, with neighboring peoples. There will be an exception, of course, and that's Japan. Japan refuses ever to enter into or there will be an exception, one or two exceptions, but it would never admit to uh, being a uh, tributary state. China and um, Korea, of course, is a very special relationship because China now is establishing also commanderies in the peninsula, in, in, in um, Korea.